Good morning, Dr. Rowe. How are you? Uh, good morning. I'm doing just great. How are you? Very good. Very good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join this series of Sentientist Conversations. It's a pleasure thank to you. talk to you. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm, I'm grateful to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, and as you know already, this is a series of conversations about what I think of as the some of the deepest and most important philosophical questions. Um, what's real and who matters ultimately, but also what can we do about trying to make a better future in the context of the answers to those questions? Um, and I have an obvious bias because I'm trying to develop and popularize a really simple philosophy or worldview called sentientism, which when it comes to that first what's real question, suggests we should take a broadly naturalistic approach where we use evidence and reason to try and work out what's true and what's real. And when it comes to the ethical question, the clue is in the name that we should have compassion, give moral status to every sentient being, any being that can suffer or flourish or feel or experience. But I'm lucky in these conversations to talk to a broad range of people who you know, some disagree and some agree with that philosophy. So it would be fascinating to understand your own journey and how you think about those questions now and what the implications are for you and your work. But before we get on to those big questions, how would you best introduce yourself and what you do. Oh, great. Yeah, my name is Catherine Rowe. Um, I have a PhD in experimental psychology, um, technically described as a neuroscientist, because the work that I did, you know, the research that I did throughout most of my career was trying to understand um, how the brain moderates certain behaviors in humans. I worked at Johns Hopkins University. I worked at the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S. And now I work with PETA and a primary goal of my job is to try to get animals out of experimentation. Um, I think probably a lot of your listeners know that about half of the biomedical research that's being conducted, certainly in the US, but probably worldwide, it involves very invasive procedures with animals. And we justify that with the concept that somehow though we're doing uh, considerable harm to these animals in the laboratories, the data that we get from those labs is going to somehow translate into benefits for human health. Mm. Um, over the course of my career in science, it became clear to me that that assumption that, that you know, the harms that we were doing were justifiable sort of fell apart as I realized. One, that the harms were much greater than I realized. I think that's important, but also that while we share many, many things with animals, including our, our sentience, um, there's a lot of species differences that make data from these labs, you know, difficult to translate into benefits for humans. And, and then the question becomes, well, what are we doing? You know, how are we allowing ourselves as a society to inflict all of these harms on tens of millions of animals each year for no reason? You know, and so that's a big part of what I do at PETA is trying to educate the scientific community, especially younger people, but also really trying to identify those areas where it's abundantly clear that we're, you know, um, causing so much harm with with very little benefit and sort of working on policy change, working on individual um, uh, procedures that are used in animals, but also trying to make sure people realize how sh how sentient these animals really are, that they they have their own needs and wants and desires. They have their own communication systems. And just because we don't understand them doesn't mean they're not there and that they need to be taken into consideration for every decision we make, including science, which often gets neglected in these discussions, you know? It does. And it's great to be able to zero in on that with you. And that journey you've taken is, is fascinating. So it's going to be really interesting to understand how the sort of your philosophical journey may be influenced the changes you've made in your own professional career too. And again, we can dig into that work in the final question we ask too. And, and for um, my audience that are interested, they may have already heard me talk about Peter's work with Ingrid, mm -hmm. who's on a previous episode. And if we go back even further into history, um, I guess the episode where we focus most strongly on animal experimentation and testing was with Dr. Aisha Akhtar mm -hmm. um, from CTS as well. So that might be another interesting link for people to follow if they want to. Um, see some more episodes that delve into these topics. But let's Definitely. let's start with that first big philosophical question of what's real. So for many of my guests, the center of that story really is this question about naturalism or supernaturalism. So some people will have a 
story about how they grew up originally in quite a naturalistic, scientific-minded context, or one that was maybe more spiritual or supernatural or mystical in some sense or religious, and how that side of their thinking's changed over their life, if it has. Um, so you can wind the clock back as far as you like to tell the story about your epistemology, I guess, and where you are now. Yeah, you know, it's in my case, I wouldn't say that I grew up in either a particularly naturalistic or supernaturalistic setting. I think um, my parents were religious, but not deeply religious. You know, it it, it yeah. formed some basis for how we approach the world. For me, I generally never thought about what I was doing in in that that context, in the context of the world. I think I was, you know, a sort of maybe self-centered little kid who who did what felt right. Um, and which religion course. was that? Um, uh, Christianity yeah. and Anglican, um, Episcopalian um, here in the U.S. Um, but again, it never really uh, took in, in my case. You know, I liked the ideas of how to treat other people, but I never needed that as a motivation. You know, whatever ethics that... I apply to my own behavior seem to generate internally mm. and through experience with other people and and other creatures on the earth you know it just it seems natural to want to cause as little harm as possible and to live in harmony with the world around us um I think uh my understanding that I was not doing that with so many behaviors that were considered acceptable whether it was what I ate or what I wore or how I viewed you know, anything from mice and spiders who might come to the house to our companion animals in the house. You know, I didn't, I wouldn't say that growing up our, our animals that we shared our homes with were full family members, the way that, that I treat the animals that live with me now. Um, yeah. And I think uh, becoming a scientist, learning about the magnificence of animals, you know, non-human animals and, and learning how complex they are, not just physiologically, but emotionally, socially started to change the way I viewed them. And for me, it started with food, you know, because I guess that was probably the most obvious way that I was exploiting animals. Um, and then things like, you know, I started to question zoos kept in captivity and I started to question horse racing. You know, one of the things that we would do just for fun, um, I never questioned. I mean, I got to be 40 years old what before I ever questioned the use of animals for scientific purposes. Yeah. You know, that was that was very uh inner circle for me. That was that was my A main final Rubicon community. to cross. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and you've already uh, sorry to stop you, but you've already demonstrated perfectly how hard it is to separate these different questions of ethics and mm -hmm. epistemology out. Um, and I think that's a deeply healthy thing. But before we move on from the sort of what's real question, it sounds like similar to my background, really, I had a sort of sort of background Anglican Christian upbringing, but it was never a central part of our lives. So mm -hmm. for me, um, I didn't really value it that deeply it wasn't a wrench to move away from it I didn't feel like I'd lost anything by moving away from it and it wasn't socially difficult to do that either and it sounds like yours was similar you just sort of drifted and left it behind is that is that fair to say or or do you do you still think of yourself as religious today I or... don't think of myself as religious today again and yeah and you know as a child as you know the the religion of your family is the one that you're the most exposed to so you don't necessarily learn all of the tenets or, or history or tradition from other religions until you get older and your social circles expand. Yeah. So I think that for me, I'm almost Unitarian if I'm anything, which is yeah. probably nothing in that there are just principles that are consistent across so many different religions and cultures. Those seem to be the ones that we should hang on to simply because of the <laughs> fact that we share them with everybody. If everybody agrees that, you know, these five things are, are the most important, um, seems seems like that should be a good place to start yeah. but i think i'm very similar to you in that it just it it, it never was a uh it never had a, a strong hold on me and so my drifting away from it was neither a big deal or a small deal for me it just yeah. was never what i was going to use to guide my actions going forward yeah so just not really a thing and i would imagine that one of the things that people either pulls people towards it or keeps people in it is that sense of, you know, I need some ethical grounding and you're already mm -hmm. clear that it, 
that's not where your ethical grounding came from. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but it sounds like you also probably just weren't very convinced by the the facts either, right? The heaven and the hell and the God and the whatever it was. It, it doesn't feel like that ever had much purchase on the way you thought. Yeah, it really didn't. Yeah, it really yeah. didn't. And, and and I couldn't give you a, a solid reason why. It just, you know, certain things you just absorb inherently, you know, it just makes sense. Yeah. And for me, that just never really made sense. And so it never, uh, you know, I never used it as my guiding principle. Makes sense. And still don't. And, yeah. Yeah. And as you, uh, and your career has very much been one that's embedded in science and the scientific process. And in a way, that's the sort of a classical example of a naturalistic way of thinking i don't necessarily think it's the only one because i tend to use evidence and reason in a in a broader sense that mm -hmm. includes the formality of science but also includes quite a lot of common sense and some personal experience and you know other other stuff as well so it's a more general idea for me but science you can see that as being a core process um but even quite a few scientists still seem to re reserve some areas of their thinking and some areas of their belief for other modes of belief. So there are many scientists who still have a religious belief that they actually are quite clear is fideistic and based on faith and requires no evidence. Have I think I know the answer already, but are there any areas of your belief system where you still reserve some sort of space for something mystical or magical or transcendent or supernatural? Or are you sort of like me, a sort of pretty boring, straightforward, naturalistic I'm down the line open. person? I'm very open to it. I would love for something more supernaturalistic to take place in my life. You know, yeah. when I hear stories of of people in their own spirituality journey or even experiences that they've had that they can't explain through, you know, data that we have available, scientific data that we have available, I think it's amazing. You know, I think there are a lot of things in the world going on that are supernatural and that we we don't understand. Maybe they have a, uh, maybe they do have a scientific explanation, but we don't know what it is yet. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I enjoy that. I think there are, are mysteries about the world that should remain mysterious. You know, having an answer to everything isn't necessarily going to provide you happiness or, or grounding, you know, it may be uh, useful to, I think it must be very useful for people who do have a strong faith to feel that there is something bigger than them out there protecting them or guiding them giving them signs that maybe they they're not recognizing when they happen you know i think that 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 can be um very uh soothing i think very comforting um and so there's a part of me that wishes i did have a little bit more of that you know yeah uh, once upon a time i was speaking to a reverend and we were having a scientific discussion about can't remember what at this point. And I had said basically what I said to you. I said, I, I don't really, you know, pray or look to God for guidance. And he said to me, you know, sometimes you need that little extra. Sometimes you need that little extra. And it almost moved me to tears because because that's true. Sometimes we do need help yeah. from, from a source that we don't know what it is. And so I, I I'm open to it, but I haven't had any experiences thus far that have really grabbed me and pulled me in um yeah. but i but i'm waiting and i, I like I'm... that mindset you're waiting for the evidence to come in first yes. before you and the, the other reason i like the way you put that is because the, there can be this sense from some people with the scientific and naturalistic world view and this can the tone can come through with quite a lot of strident atheists as well that there's this super confidence that none of this stuff exists at all and that, that can become its own form of dogma and maybe even its own form of wishful thinking so that idea of uncertainty and doubt and humility and almost some excitement that there mm -hmm. are things out that we don't know i i think that's the core of a real scientific world view it's it's the it's the uncertainty and the doubt that drives the process not a super confidence that we've got the right answer and yeah. i think you're your and your your journey through science, I think, will will also demonstrate that because one of the as we're talking about epistemology, one of the challenges you'll hear from someone who are trying to reject a naturalistic way of thinking mm -hmm. or a scientific way of thinking, one one might just be a fideistic approach, which is, well, how can you not believe the Bible or the Quran? Or I've had a personal experience that I think shows me that reality is radically different, so that's what I choose to believe. And it's difficult, really, to know where to go on those things because if they're not using evidence and reason it's quite hard to have a conversation using evidence and reason to progress but 
you know, still interesting. Um, but other people will instead actually challenge science and the naturalistic way of thinking by talking about the failures of science as an institution mm -hmm. and the problems of science and the fact that it's human and it isn't perfect and it makes mistakes and so on. Um, I should ask a question, really, but how do you respond to when people, you know, challenge the enterprise of science and its integrity? Oh, I agree that that <laughs> the integrity of science is worth questioning. Um, scientists, all of them, are fallible, mm. just like anybody in any career. They may have expertise in certain areas that others don't, but that doesn't mean that they can't mistake make mistakes. They can't be um, short-sighted or biased by their own beliefs, whether they're religious or scientific, right? Absolutely. That dictates how we think. Um, one of the main challenges in my work that I face with the scientific community is um, currently, and I don't think this was always true, but it has been true for several decades now, um, the science scientists as a whole are under an enormous amount of pressure to get their data published. Um, because that is the benchmark that we use, whether it's if you're trying to obtain grant funding from your government or from a um, nonprofit organization, whether you're trying to achieve tenure or have career advancement, the benchmark we use in the scientific world is publications. Yeah. And what that means, it means a lot of things for scientific integrity. One is that people are often publishing very quickly, um, maybe not checking their data. We we see. Um, a number of publications that need to be retracted or corrected because they are either deliberately fraudulent or just were done in such a harried fashion that they're they're inaccurate or misleading. Um, and I think most importantly, and the thing that I, I am really concerned about is that we have no longer, or, or many scientists have lost sight of their original goal, which was to get accurate answers about a certain question, whether it's you know, what is the best way to treat cancer or how is it that, you know, what chemicals are, are most detrimental during development? And and those are the goals that most scientists start their careers with. But the need to get those grants, the need, need to get those papers, the need to keep your job interferes to the point where I think scientific integrity is in a crisis, you know, where we're, we're no longer getting great answers and that erodes the public's trust you know yeah. if if one day on the news you hear oh don't eat this because you're going to get cancer and then five years later you know you've you've you know obliterated that from your diet hoping to benefit your own health and then five years later you find out oh that was just a study done with with rats it has nothing to do with you and yeah. in fact what you've been eating is what you should have been avoiding you know it 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 makes sense to me that people are wary of scientific findings i think that in a lot of cases that's a, a fair wariness. Um, yeah. And I think it's always correct to, criti to criticize science. I mean, that's what science is. It's supposed yeah. to constantly evolve. And, and if it's not, then then the scientists are failing. And so I, I, think, I approve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that it can be frustrating because it's undoubtable that all those problems exist. You look at the replication crisis and the social mm -hmm. sciences and many of the things you talked about there and and scientists are flawed humans like everybody else and the systems are flawed and warp people in different ways um mm -hmm. so one approach is to say i guess the, the radical approach is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, give up on the entire enterprise and turn to alternative um you know sources of knowledge from basically mm -hmm. grifters and <laughs> people who've just made stuff up right to sell mm -hmm. supplements or whatever it might be so you right. almost give up on not just science but you give up on naturalism as a way of understanding the world and just go mm -hmm. to something to my mind arbitrary and often very damaging yeah the, very the other approach is to i think your concluding point is look the, the whole point of science is that self-criticism and that error correction which doesn't mean you never make errors it means okay they're all being made all the time but the mm -hmm. process ultimately is incentivized to find them and correct them and become less wrong over time. And, and then we can look to improve the enterprise of science and actually make science a better form of naturalism rather than to sort of give up. But it's it, particularly in the current zeitgeist, it is frustrating that people will use those institutional problems to basically abandon mm -hmm. the entire institution of science and yes. apply a really weird sort of skepticism. So their skepticism of institutions and science is extremely strong. And you and I would agree that we should all be skeptical of scientific endeavor but they also at the same time seem to be breathtakingly gullible about 
alternative sources of information and fabrication. It's like, and, and my argument would be, look, don't drop your scepticism in established mm-hmm. science, but at least be just as sceptical of all these other things you're picking exactly. up on YouTube. But, yeah. I think that I think that there's a difference between healthy skepticism or healthy analytical approaches to information you're being given versus simply absorbing the information that's the most consistent with what you already believe, right? Yeah. So I think the public as a whole would be good to uh, try harder to critically analyze the information you're being given you're being given. What is the source of that information? What is the motivation behind the person giving you that yeah. information? And really, you know, looking at things from both sides to find your truth, which is generally the truth somewhere in the middle. And as you said, unfortunately, what's happened is that we've got this extreme polarization where you have people who are in the, in the process of trying to defend science, which I also agree with. You know, yeah. I, I want to both defend and criticize science at the same time, but it takes, you know, practice. It takes effort. It takes energy to be able to do that effectively. But I think we've got this polarization, certainly here in the U.S., um, where people will will uphold the scientific community as as being the end all be all and infallible, which is a mistake, yeah. or as you said, reject it entirely <laughs> and yeah. you know gravitate towards something that has no basis in reality. And so where is the happy medium? You know, where is the place to land? And I do think that ultimately, you know, the scientific community needs to do a better job of um, correcting their own mistakes and and being transparent about that. Thing. This Completely. is what we thought we knew. We were wrong. We have new information. Here's the new information. Um, treating the public like they're intelligent because they are. Um, yeah. And, but also, you know, not necessarily saying that, you know, not being so adamant that they're correct, that it gives people only the, op, you know, the only way to reject it is to completely reject it. The, yeah. There's a gray area here that is, is most important to live in, but it's also very difficult to live yeah, in. Completely agree. And I think the two things that help generally, one is just making clear that these sort of views of credences or beliefs are provisional. You know, they mm-hmm. may, should change as the evidence changes, but also that they're probabilistic as well. You know, it's not mm-hmm. yes or no, true or not true. It's the evidence is strong or weak and maybe changing. And exactly. so that uncertainty is built in. And it's it's frustrating because sometimes people have this hunger for certainty. Mm-hmm. So that uncertainty can come across as feeling a little bit weak or inconclusive, but I think that's the battle we've got to win. We we have to under, help people understand that the nature of human knowledge about reality just is provisional and probabilistic. So if you, Absolutely. you know, the, the more you recognize that, the mm-hmm. um, the better we'll do. So, well, let, yeah. so that, go on, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and, I, and it's a little bit of a side note, but I also think that the mainstream media who are often the, the primary source of health and medical information, but, but all information, right, that people are getting uh, tend to simplify uh, things. And so those probabilistics, those statistics, those maybe, you know, get lost in that simplification. And so, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's important for people to realize that, that very little is 100% certain. Um, And, but, but again, that, you know, the mainstream media could, could maybe do a better job of, of presenting the information in a way that the public can understand it with with a certain degree of complexity that I think yeah. we underestimate people's ability to do. Yeah, people can get this stuff, right? People mm-hmm. can get this I, stuff. Absolutely. And, and there's, there's a great example in the UK. This infects many you know, newspapers and journals and online sites, but we have one called the Daily Mail. And, mm-hmm. and people have done some fascinating examples of picking out headlines over the years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's chocolate cures cancer. Chocolate causes cancer. <laughs> bacon causes cancer. Bacon cures cancer. Cheese. Mm-hmm. It's like, and you can almost pick it. And, mm-hmm. and you can absolutely guarantee that it was not in the abstract of any of the scientific papers yep. that said. Yep. There was a 2% increase in the incidence yeah. of cancer in people who ate bacon every day. Yeah. Don't and the bacon. base rate and the base rate incidence was X, which is also never mentioned. Yes, so I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. So mm-hmm. so I think we've answered this sort of what's real question. And the answer is we don't really know, but here's some we good ways know. of here's some good ways of, you know, forming our credences using mm-hmm. evidence and reason and having that humility. So so that's been fascinating. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to some of those themes as we talk about your work too. The second big question um, that often links is this question of 
what matters and who matters. And you've hinted that all uh, that already. Um, so for many people with a strongly religious background, the ethics comes as part of the package. You have the Bible or the Quran, you have rules, what's good, what's bad. And you often have a deity looking over your shoulder, ready to punish or reward, depending on how you do. Um, for people who, for whom that was never that central, like you or me, it can come from different places. And you already talked about the fact that you do identify with many of the common elements that run through different religious worldviews mm -hmm. and non-religious worldviews, you know, caring about other people and so on. But if I had to ask you to summarise, you know, what do good and bad, right and wrong even mean to you these days? How uh, is there a way of summarising summarizing that? I think... I don't know if there's a way of summarizing it. It's such an important question. One I should really, you know, be thinking about every night and morning um, <laughs> when I start my day. But, you know, for me, it's it's uh, increasing your circle of empathy to include everyone and everything. Because mm. to me, everything matters. Every animal who feels pain or fear or, or can suffer, uh, you know, matters. Um, every person matters, you know, whether we have anything in common, we could disagree from start to finish. But the truth is, you know, everything on this planet, everything in this universe is here for a purpose. Um, we don't understand what that purpose is, whether it's just to keep ourselves going or whether there is something bigger out there. I think humans, and, and I've certainly been guilty of this and probably still am in many facets. Um, tend to consider ourselves the the superior species on this planet and that everything around us is here for us, whether it's to build yeah. a boat or build a house or eat or entertain us, you know, in some cases, instead of thinking about everything around us being here with us, yeah. you know, that yeah. we're part of a much, a very complicated system. And whether you want to talk about that in scientific terms, in terms of like ecosystems um or at a more spiritual level which is it's 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 here for a purpose everything interacts you know we exploit one resource a disaster occurs you know we sometimes don't see it for 40 years but the truth is when we take the attitude that we can just have when we can just take without any consequences to us one we're wrong there's always yeah. a consequence it may not be immediate but there's always a consequence. I think so for me, everything matters. And I think being mindful about every decision you make, and it's not just, you know, for me, obviously, because I care so much about animals and the planet, I think about that, but it's, it can be, you know, how pleasant or unpleasant you are in the store. It can be yep. whether you choose to drive that day, you know, every decision you make doesn't just impact you. Yeah. It impacts the greater place what you know and and the bigger you picture that space you think about not just you and your family but the world you know the the more you realize every decision you make matters yeah so it's a combination of that the empathy you mentioned at the beginning mm -hmm. which to my mind is uh trying to understand how others feel mm -hmm. and, and i guess we layer onto that the sympathy of feeling that with them and even the compassion of being motivated to help and not hinder and uh not not harm and and so on um, so I think it's a, that combination with that commitment to being actually thoughtful, because you can mm -hmm. have that empathy and that compassion. But if you're not thoughtful about what you do, mm -hmm. you know, so what? So I, I really like that combination. And the my, my only hesitation about the, um, you know, we're all here for a purpose question, mm -hmm. which I can see some value in. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about that sort of te teleology Mm. Partly because of what you mentioned earlier on, that us humans normally assume that we're the point. Right. And, <laughs> so we're and, very and, egocentric, yeah. Yeah, so often that flow, you know, that can flow from a religious worldview where there's a very clear hierarchy normally of deity, priests, normal humans, or in-group humans, out-group humans, and then, you know, animals and the rest of the planet are just there under our dominion to be used. But the ultimate point is us, and then the ultimate, ultimate point is Mm -hmm. the deity so that tele teleologic and, yes. and sort of warp things in different ways um but i think you can also get to that hierarchical view through a completely naturalistic scientific warped scientific worldview as well where people will talk about as though we're the sort of peak of some evolutionary process or we have mm -hmm. 
capabilities that no other non-human animal has. And, you know, so there are all sorts of different ways our, us humans are brilliant at putting ourselves at the top of a hierarchy and then saying, everything's here for a purpose. And guess who the most important purpose is? Yes. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think you're right. There is a danger. When I say we all are here for purpose, I mean, every living creature yeah. on the planet, you know, that not just humans and not at an individual level, you know, you have to think about it as your purpose, whatever it might be, is part of an intricate network. Um, yeah. that is constantly, constantly interacting with the purposes of those around you. And if you're interfering with the purposes of those beings around you, you're never going to find your own, right? Yeah. Because you're too, you know, but but you're right. It's very important. Well, to me, it's very important for people to, I hope, start to reject this notion that humans are the purpose. And again, it does, you know, come from both some of the scientific data out there about what we can do versus what other animals can do, though that is falling apart. Oh yeah. The more we learn. <laughs> yes. The more we learn, the more we realize that our capabilities are not greater. They may be different, but they're not better. They're not superior. They're not unique. Um, they're just different. You know, there's so much data now that, that, that certainly marine mammals are potentially smarter than we are yeah. and more socially uh developed than we are you know there are species there are so many species out there that have just these phenomenal capacities to do things that we can't i mean yeah. you know you can think about it in your own your own home if you have companion animals things that you're if you have a companion dog or a companion cat they may not be able to have this conversation but they are communicating with each other in ways that you will never understand you know you don't have the same capacities they do they don't have the same capacities we do the point is we all have capacities that are worth something interacting together. Yeah. Um, and once you disrupt that, there are consequences. Yeah. And, and my sense of those, you know, it's, I think it's really interesting intellectually to understand those capacities just because it helps us to understand each other better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we as humans seem to have a lot of power, but our track record of using that is pretty awful so i'm not sure that's something to be too proud of mm -mm. But the, and then the capacities themselves i think are intellectually interesting and they can be interesting because they can help us understand how the lives of a being could be better or worse mm -hmm. but they don't affect the the moral question of does that being matter but so so to me again the clue is in the name it comes back to this basic quality of sentience and any being mm -hmm. regardless of its capacities if it can suffer or flourish if it can experience things it, it matters morally and I'm interested in your journey there, because I think it's quite clear where you stand now that at least humans and non-human animals count in that sense. Yeah. Um, do you think of sentience as being the reason why those entities count or is it something else? Is it the, t the term animal or is it? And would you would you even go beyond animals um, in some circumstances in terms of thinking about moral beings and entities that we should care about? I think, yes. So the first time I heard the term sentience, I thought, what an awkward word for, <laughs> for, for what is a very complicated but critical way of thinking. Um, and then, you know, through my work, I've obviously adopted that term and used it, you know, frequently to as a justification, because I think it's the one that most people can understand when you talk about pain, when you talk about suffering, that that elicits an empathy that um, will hopefully help guide how people, you know, treat other people, but other other living creatures on the planet, understanding that they do feel pain, understanding that they will be fearful, understanding that they have their own uh, reason to be here and, and they, they don't want to die. You know, whether it's a spider crawling across your kitchen floor or a pig in a factory farm or a mouse in a lab, they don't want to suffer any more than you do. So I think that I do use sentience as a way of discussing the morality of how we treat other animals. I'm not sure it's what guides my my own behavior. Mm. Um, it does, I think, I think that it has um, opened my eyes um, to the damage that we do. And it can be very difficult to you know i spend a lot of time each day reading you know scientific papers these are things that are published in journals 
going through the method section, which is you know the the portion for your listeners, the portion in the in the journal where they describe what the procedures were yeah. on the animals, and you know this monkey was caged alone his entire life. He had a surgery to you know inflict brain damage to region A. He had a surgery to uh, add a head post. Um, he's never interacted with another monkey. The, the sentence of that monkey will will affect me, you know, because I'll think I, I you're, you're imagining what it would be like to be yes, there in yes. whatever way you can. Yeah, exactly. And and that can be devastating. Um, it can be devastating. We all know this, you know, whether you're seeing a video of an animal being harmed or you're reading and you picture yourself. I mean, I think that's I think that's how we expand our empathy to begin with. Right. Is is putting ourselves in the position of another with the assumption that the another will that the other will will feel the same way we do yeah about being in that position um and i do think that helps expand our empathy i think the best way to go through life is to assume that that what would hurt you will hurt somebody else what would frighten you would you might be wrong because obviously there's a lot of of differences across the, even people what might scare you wouldn't scare me or vice versa but yeah, I it, oh, it's a tough um, question. And my 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 sense of it from because mm-hmm. I've been lucky to talk to some amazing people on this topic, people like Mark Solms and uh, Walter Veet and Heather right. Browning and um, Franz De Waal and and others. But my sense of it is one: yes, we should be hesitant about you know anthropomorphizing our experience into non-human animals. Mm-hmm. Fine, right? We shouldn't overplay this. Um, but at the same time, the more fundamental our interests and our needs are, mm-hmm. the deeper their roots in evolutionary history seem to be, and the more yes. widely spread they are across the animal kingdom. So mm-hmm. fine, you know, I don't know if you know a monkey can experience existential angst or in the same way as I do, but right. we can be absolutely confident about not enjoying pain and right. wanting freedom and autonomy and wanting yes. social bonds and and family bonds and those experiences mm-hmm. and you know, the, the more fundamental these things are, the more broadly shared they are, and the more confident we can be that, you know, non-human sentience share them. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to think about it, because again, it's that fundamental level, mm. which is also ultimately the things we avoid the most, right? Like, sure, we all want to be rich and famous, or I don't want to be rich and famous. Some people want to be rich and famous, or some people want to travel, or some people want to have a large family, and that can differ, but we all would like to avoid pain and suffering. Yeah. We would all yeah. like to have. Autonomy. Yeah, they're the most important to us. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is true from a neurological point of view, from a neuroscience point of view. You know, the most fundamental systems are the ones that we have the most in common with with other species, and it's you know the ones that are evolutionarily the oldest. Yeah, are the things we have the most in common. So, yeah, yeah no, and, I think that's wise. And I don't always ask this question because sentientism, I've tried to frame it as being really pluralistic and and broad. Um, So it doesn't have a particular philosophy of mind or a scientific worldview about what consciousness and sentience actually are. It just says, well, whatever they are, they matter, right? If I stick a fork in my hand, that hurts. That's a bad thing, right? So regardless of what these things are, do you have a view as to you know, what consciousness or sentience ultimately are? Is there, you know, there are panpsychists, there are illusionists, there are functionalists, there are you know, all sorts of different ways of thinking about yeah. what this amazing thing might be that's going on in our heads. Do you have a view or do you sort of shut up and do the science approach instead? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Sometimes when you get to the, what, you know, to me are these really higher order questions, sometimes my brain does shut down because it is the the, the enormity of, um, the complexity of what that answer is going to be can sometimes be overwhelming. And so then you think, well, let me just, you know, and this is what science is, right? You have this big picture question and then you whittle it down to something that's more approachable. And mm-hmm. so I do think that I I tend to do that. Um, I also uh, was very influenced back in my, you know, again, when I was 18, 19 years old by, you know, the 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 natural selection of of life and and the idea that you're you're biologically driven to survive and reproduce and so when i think about the tenants that we you know that fall under the umbrella of sentientism i can't even say the word that well but but it's it's those things right yeah. like 
you know, pain usually not good. Um, yeah. You know, you, you're trying to avoid losing your life losing your capacity to be a part of this world or to reproduce in this world. And so I think that that ultimately, I, I do think of it as a survival level um, drive that has evolved to a, a whole number of different behaviors, a whole host of different behaviors that ultimately, but but that's just a philosophy. That's just because yeah. of the the influence of say Charles Darwin back when I was, you know, opening my very first biology textbook back in the day. And that just took, that made sense to me in the same way that say the things I was learning in the church didn't gel. They didn't connect with my brain, you know, saying that there, you know, there's X number of species on this planet, all of whom are constantly evolving to survive the longest and reproduce the most in the context of all the other species right like because it's yeah. you're not in a vacuum humans may think they're in a vacuum we're not in a vacuum um has influenced the way i think about all of the behaviors that animals do or don't have that share or don't share that are that make us unique that make us uh the same all have to do with trying to make our way in this world in the short term and in the long term but that's I don't know how philosophical that is. It just, it does seem to be where my brain lands when I, when I do take the time to think about these things, bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. That evolutionary context to me is, is essential. That's probably the view I have most, most affinity to. So, yeah. So, th so the, before we finish on this, what matters question, this who matters question we've come on to, that's been really clear. Um, one of the odd things about this topic is that I think most humans around the world will probably agree with this in theory about, mm -hmm caring about non-human animal suffering and death. But of course, they struggle to put it into practice. And you hinted already at your journey, and you mentioned that it started with food, but it, it'd be interesting to understand um, how you went through that journey of actually thinking about putting this compassion for non-human animals and I guess sentience more broadly into practice. And you know, was that a tough, long road or something where there was just a series of light bulbs? There were a off. series of light bulbs. I'm glad mm. you said it that way because it was very incremental. Um, and there was a certain resistance socially at the time, not giving up meat. Um, and I and I started as vegetarian. And and really that was just, I don't need to kill any other animal to eat. You know, and, and again, I was in a position where that was true, where there were, you know, multiple sources of food available that weren't meat that, you know, met all the nutritional requirements. And it wasn't until seeing video footage of, um, you know, dairy farms, seeing what what chickens and cows, who maybe weren't necessarily killed immediately, but were having, in, you know, an entire lifetime of misery. Yeah. And that was I didn't need to even think, oh, this is a cow, this is a sentient being. They feel pain and suffering. Just the visual imagery of what was going on in these farms was was enough for me to say, I'm not going to participate in this. But that was it. It wasn't. I'm not going to advocate for you know veganism to other people. I'm just. I'm just going to passively resist here by saying, I'm not going to participate in this. Um, I did my graduate work at the University of California, San Diego, and in San Diego, there's a, a world famous zoo, and it is it is very large and and has very large spaces for the animals compared to some other zoos that. And I remember going because it was right there and uh, having a conversation with a friend where I said, is this OK? You know, I had never thought about it. I just thought, is, is it OK to, you know, confine these animals in an environment where they're not supposed to live um, so we can see them conveniently, you know? Yeah. Um, and this friend's argument was, well, sure, I think they've got it pretty good. You know, they've got like space to run and. Um, San Diego Zoo puts in foliage and they have people to feed them. And I said, well, but, you know, isn't this kind of like if somebody offered you a really nice house or apartment and said you can have the food and you can have your, you know, at the time there weren't iPads and iPhones, but whatever we had back then. And, you know, there's exercise, you know, you can go outside, there'll be a little yard, you can go stand in there, but you have to stay there the rest of your life. You have no opportunity to make a choice for yourself. Your biological needs might be met but in in the in the barest form and that started me thinking more critically and mm. then we went to a, again this was all in san diego we went to a the del mar racetrack which is a horse racing track 
I'd never been. I didn't really know what it was about. And one of the horses during one of the races went down. And the person I was with said, oh, they'll shoot the horse. And I thought, wait, we're, we're running these horses to death one way or the other. They either die from the injuries. They die from the drugs. They die from, from what have you. For This is for entertainment, for us, and money for somebody else. I mean, there's really no justification I can come up with. And then that just started me thinking about like anywhere that animals were being used or, you know, but it was a process, you know, yeah. it was, and anything that had been ingrained in me as socially acceptable was harder. You know, it's always easy to look and say, oh, I would never shoot a lion in the, in the, of course not. I would never be where a lion was. So it's making that yeah. claim as a, as me making a, a profound ethical decision is ridiculous. It's an easy it's, thing for you to say if you don't habitually shoot lions. <laughs> exactly. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go mm. on safari. Of course you're not, you know, or I'm not going to race horses. No, that would never be something that I would do. I'm not in that world. Um, yeah. So there's safe things to condemn. Easy there things are to condemn, always yeah. safe things to reject. Right. Um, and I started with the easiest things. Like I'm not going to wear fur. I'm not going to go to horse races. And, and of course I would never go to, a, you know, I would never hunt a lion because that wasn't part of the, my, my social construct to begin with. Once it, once I had to start thinking about my own behaviors, things that I had always assumed were acceptable, that was where the challenge came in. And as I mentioned early on, animals exploited for science was the last frontier. I mean, it probably isn't. Yeah. I'm sure there will be mm. more. I will continue to learn and continue, to, I hope, continue to grow and continue to adjust myself for the greater good. But for me, as an overall um, philosophy, animals use and experimentation was not on the table for something to criticize. Yeah. So yeah. let's so let's come on to that now, because the, the final question we ask is, how can we make a better future? Which is almost as crazily broad as what's real and who matters. Um, and we can go as broad as you like here because people will talk about intrahuman challenges that we want, need to face and improve. I talk about climate change and the non-human animal space. Of course, we talk about that a great deal because when you look at sentientism against default human value systems and behaviours, that disconnect about how we treat non-human animals is just so stark and vicious that's nearly always the centre of gravity. But then when we're talking about that space, food looms large just because of the scale of animal agriculture. So as I've mentioned, I've had you know great conversation with Asha Akhtar about experimentation and, and testing and so on, but it doesn't come up that much. You know, it is um, m maybe a, a distinct and different topic. And I sometimes think that that's, that's partly because people worry that it's less of a clear ethical choice. You know, with food, you have this idea that, well, some people might have a survival need for animal foods, but for most people, it's purely just a, a pleasure thing and a social norm thing. But there is this sense of a justification shield around animal experimentation that before you look into it, there's this assumption that it must all be extremely well justified by human health and longevity and so on. But um, so so you can you can start with any some sort of broad views, if you like, or we can just dive into the, you know your space, I guess, and understand the story well i think you're absolutely right and and i can say this as a as it was true for me personally was that you know this this there was a, a protective bubble around animals used for science and and part of that was because i was a member of that community um but i think it's also the case i think i think most people um including me years ago thought two main things right one was that you know, animals being used in laboratories are treated very, very well. The harms are kept at a minimum. Um, the, these these things are only done if it's absolutely scientifically necessary, and that the data that we're getting from these, you know, minimally harmful, uh, non-invasive, uh, critical experiments are are going to benefit the the humans in some capacity, and and that was the justification for it. You know, there was a lot of I think, you know, misinformation given out. And, and this is even to members of the scientific community who aren't using animals. There's this 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 in, uh, inaccurate belief that, you know, rats in laboratories are treated well, mice in laboratories are treated well. And and these are scientists, you know, these are people who care and 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 have gone to school for X number of years and are in the 
you know, in the business of the greater good, right? And so how they they certainly, if they're going to use a mouse, they're only going to do it if they have to, and they're going to do it with the, the least invasive. This is just not true. I mean, and it's it's it was shocking to me. So I imagine it's shocking to everybody else, but I, I and I'm sure um, Aisha talked about this and, and Ingrid talked about this when you spoke with them, but um, one, the animals suffer incredibly in laboratories and, and, and that's just baseline. So taking an animal out of the wild or buying an animal from a breeder and keeping them in a cage its entire life, their entire lives is harmful. Like it, it's harmful because they do not have the autonomy. They do not have the coping skills that they would have in nature to deal with the stress of being poked and prodded and they are poked and prodded, you know, even just for, for maintenance, they are poked and prodded, but most animals are, you know, we have tumors being grafted onto mice for cancer research. We have uh, monkeys with whose brains are being cut into, or we have a, a, an untold number of animals being inflicted with diseases that they would never get in nature. These are diseases that affect humans. And so scientists want answers but these animals wouldn't get those diseases naturally. So they're given chemicals, they're given, you know, neurological damage, tissue damage, what have you, to create versions of these diseases in the animals that aren't comparable to what even humans get. So, you know, the first debunk that I think is important for people to think is that it is harmful. Like, yeah, it's harmful. You may be comfortable with those harms, but it is harmful. And and if you pick up a scientific journal, if you pick up a mainstream media article or look at a website or of a laboratory that's using animals they will have the most adorable picture of a monkey in a tree or a maybe they'll have a picture of a mouse he or she'll be sitting on a countertop or maybe they'll do something cute or they'll have the mouse sitting in a petri dish but what you won't see are all the sutures and all of the tumors and the dried blood that um is what most animals in laboratories look like because they've had these procedures done to them. So yeah. that's the first thing. It is extraordinarily harmful. Um, they are suffering. They are sentient. They they do feel fear. And 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 this has now been measured, you know, um, in these laboratories, because the animals are in the laboratories for reason A, we found out, you know, oh, they're they're terrified. You know, their their stress hormones are are through the roof when somebody with a white lab coat comes near them because they're afraid of the pain and suffering that that white coat represents to them. And they have, you know, biological measurements of that, that, that fear, that pain, that stress. Um, yeah, that becomes, thing, that, that becomes a subject of the scientific inquiry in its own. Yes, right, it does. It? Yeah, mm -hmm, it does. Um, I suppose that could be considered a benefit, but since the scientific community isn't using that knowledge to end what they're doing, it's not, right? Yeah. It's more just interesting. Oh, how interesting that that rats feel empathy for each other. They do. How interesting that 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 rats enjoy complex cognitive tasks. Of course they do. They're very, very smart. How interesting that monkeys who are forced to live alone in a cage start biting themselves and pulling their own hair out. Oh, now we know what that social isolation is bad. These are, I'm sorry, the dog has grabbed a squeaky toy. And I <laughs> Ginny has the squeaky toy back. <laughs> Ginny has a squeaky toy. Bring that to me, please. Can you, oh, well, you like to have a, you like to have a flow. So you, you Ginny might is very to, welcome. Ginny is very welcome. Can you bring me that? So we're not going to squeak it. Thank you. Bring it to me. Come here. Bring it to me. She, she would like to point out that she is also intelligent and complex and has her own needs, including playtime. Um, yeah. I think that the, yeah, so I think that a lot of, of scientific inquiry focused on animal sentience has not benefited animals whatsoever because it's merely a point of curiosity, not something that has uh, affected policy or affected how we approach, how we treat animals. Hopefully... Yeah. Yes, you know, and certainly a lot of us in this in this field try to do that to say, listen, you know, rats are very similar to us in their social needs. Monkeys are very similar to us and our, you know, and hope that that can generate some empathy. Um, the other myth I would like to debunk, though, is that any scientific research that uses animals is benefiting humans because that is that is flagrantly untrue. Um, the failure rates are, are very, very high uh, when you're talking about something like drug development, which is what most people think about when they think about biomedical research is, is there a new treatment? Is there a new um, pharmaceutical compound that would 
alleviate symptoms or help people with certain illnesses, that failure rate is, you know, on average somewhere between 92 and 95%. So a new drug that tested safe and effective in an animal in a laboratory will go on to fail in human clinical trials 92 to 95% of the time. And there are failure rates that are even higher than that. So, you know, new drugs for Alzheimer's disease, new drugs for cancer, new drug, new HIV vaccine, sepsis, um, the failure rates are at 100% or nearly 100%. Wow. So it's, so in a sense, it's, it might be adding a, a, a slice of information, you know, it's better than mm-hmm. nothing in terms of pure information, but it's not adding much, right? It's not adding I much. Mean, the confidence you can get from that is... Minimal. Yeah. It, it's minimal. And I think most people don't realize that, you know, they, they and, and I think it's important because, it, you know, we talked about this earlier, that the information that you're also given leaves out all the nuance. And sometimes the, the, the import is in the nuance. So saying, oh, they, they did this new study in mice at the University of, of X. And one day that might, you know, this is, this is promising new treatment for cancer. And it's, well, it has a one in a million chance of, of benefiting a human, but that gets left out. It's just the potential and the potential is much lower than I think most people assume. And the, you know, the, the, the quote unquote devils in the details, but the details are that a lot of the data from animal experiments isn't translating to humans, whether that's basic information that we're trying to get about how systems work or drug specific information. Is it safe? Is it effective? What are the side effects? You know, and that bears out, you know, a lot of people are, are, have been waiting for decades if, if they have that kind of time, which a lot of people don't, but as a society, we've been waiting for, for better treatments for cancer. We've been waiting for the HIV vaccine. We need a new treatment for sepsis. We need something to treat neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and the number of promising research that comes out of animal models, if you read the the mainstream press, seems like with one every day. But the truth is those don't actually make it into the clinic. Yeah. And then again, that gray area of whether we can justify what we're doing, the harms we're doing to animals in labs with the benefits that are few and far between, you know, it's a different question than most people actually ask. It's yeah. just, is it okay to hurt a few mice? To benefit millions of humans that's not the question that's yeah. not the question the question is is it okay to kill tens of millions of animals each year forcing them to live a life of misery and suffering on the off chance with the slight possibility that this might benefit a human 20 years from now that's yeah. the question so and, and most different. people don't realize yeah it's very yeah, so whatever approach you might want to take to it it's a very different ethical calculus and different yes. balance and is yes. it fair to say that there there probably is a spectrum from some of the most brutally egregious experimentation that even if it's scientifically successful has basically no valid application to providing benefit whatsoever and some of the things you've described seem to be torture purely for intellectual curiosity mm-hmm. right so there's that there's one extreme there's and then from there, you can work through mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, things that maybe are less harmful, less invasive, and, and maybe progressively, there might actually be some, you know, some stronger justification. So at the other end, maybe there's something where you could say, well, there's a stronger justification story, it's less harmful. Do you think of it in those terms? Or are, can we cleanly think of it as something we just shouldn't be doing at all? Is that is that just oversimplistic is this sort of spectrum idea helpful or, or is it a slippery not. slope yeah it, it's both so for me it's not oversimplistic i think once you come to adjust your mindset that animals are not here for us right they're here with us and that they are sentient and that they do suffer you can get yourself to a place where it's not justifiable at all yeah you know regardless of whether there's going to be a benefit or not i think however when you're working to change a system that's been in place for hundreds of years and that the bulk of society has has you know invested in one way or the other um and believes in one way or the other that sometimes you do need to uh, work along a gradient um and for me i think the the first step is always 
debunking the assumption that most people have, which is it's very few animals. It's it's not invasive. It's not harmful most of the time. And it's always beneficial because overall, that's what people think is true. And overall, it's not true. Um, I do think that, it, at least for me, it does happen where a certain series of experiments will be um, more frustrating to learn that they're occurring because it's so obvious that they're yeah. just curiosity driven and that they, yeah. you know, that, that even the people doing them couldn't possibly have convinced an, an oversight committee or a grant committee to fund this. Um, and yet they did. Um, they managed to convince somebody that whatever curiosity question they're hoping to answer is worth what they're doing to animals. And, and that can make me even more frustrated than than say something that had a higher potential. That doesn't mean that it's actually more or less wrong. Yeah. Um, but I think for people who are on a journey of trying to assess for themselves, and right, this is a decision most people do have to make for themselves, hopefully with as much information as we can get to to them and share with them and get for ourselves. Um I think it is it is incremental. Yeah. You know, I think it's a it it can be a balance for people, you know. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I have to guard against here, going back to our conversation about epistemology, is motivated reasoning. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I will look at something like animal exp experimentation and see the horror of it. And um, so there are things I want to believe. I, I want to believe it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. And I want to believe there are win wins where we can actually do science in a way that is not just doesn't harm non human animals, but is actually more effective for the purposes of human health and longevity that we're trying to work for. So I want to believe those things. How do one is, are those things, how, how true are those things? And two, how can we be careful that it's not the motivated reasoning that is taking us into maybe naive solutions that mm -hmm. could undermine the integrity of the effort people like right. you are making. Right. Well, and I think that's right. I think that's right on both sides. I think that, if you're a scientist who happens to work with animals, and, and I say happens because it it is almost at chance when you're a young undergraduate um, university student, you are interested in science and they you know often assign you to a laboratory to work in. And if that laboratory uses animals, then you're likely to spend the rest of your career using animals. And if your laboratory does not, I mean, it really is almost a flip of a coin, whether you um, end up doing experiments with animals or using more human relevant methods and yeah. it gets made when you're 18. But if you're on that, the I'm using animals in harmful procedures for science, you are going to convince yourself, right? That it's, it's going to benefit somebody some way. You would almost have to. Yeah. Right? As like a self-defense mechanism to it, keep oh, doing yeah, what think, you're doing. Yeah, exactly. And the people who can't do that are the ones who get out of that. Um, but in terms of, 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 the, the idea that there are non-animal, non-harmful non ways to answer some of the more important health questions, there are. Um, and those are, are those have been developed and validated um, for two reasons. One is because of the ethical considerations of using animals in harmful procedures. You know, that would be the, the my motivation. But there are many, many people within the scientific community who are motivated by the science so it's not that they're opposed to using animals. It's not that they are, you know, um, in the same position we are, where we're concerned about the harms. It's because they're concerned about the quality of the science. Yeah. Because we are so different from from uh, non-human animals in all the ways that matter when it comes to health advances. You know, obviously we get different diseases. We have different longevity. Um, the diseases that we're most pressed to try to treat and cure are often non-existent in non-human animals yeah. so having human relevant research methods is something collectively we need for for the animals and those of us who care about them but for the science and for the patients who need these treatments because again the the failure rates of new drugs that, that are treat you know that test safe and effective in non-human animals fail in human animals. And so what we have now are, you know, just to start, we have a, a, an enormity of, of imaging technology. These are non-invasive ways to look at the human body and at the, at the cellular level, at the neurochemical level. And again, those tools were developed because the data, you know, from cutting into an animal 
you can get all those details, but they're not relevant to humans. So um, all of the all of the the complex in vitro systems we have now, I, I mean, Aisha may have talked about things like organs on chips. You know, these are these yeah. are complex microphysiological systems, organoids, little miniature versions of human organs, often derived from patients themselves. So, you know, a lot of the patient populations who are who are desperate for better treatments and cures are uh, heterogeneous, meaning that a treatment that let's say would work for you might not work for me. And the medical community doesn't always know why, and they yeah. can't always predict it. Um, but using these, you know, precision medicine, patient derived treatments, using these, these um, cell systems derived from, from humans to start with, because it's more human relevant, yeah. but sometimes so specific to an individual patient. Yeah. It's not just zeroing in on the right species. It's zeroing yes. on on the patient themselves yeah. on the patient themselves and 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 again these tools were developed are are have been developed and are continuing to, to develop not just because of the ethical considerations that would be my motivation um and so i can see why people might question because you know i'm in it for the animals but it's the the, the motivation is also scientific and health driven it's because we are wasting an enormous amount of time and energy and money and harming I mean, it, I mean, it's literally countless because we're talking about hundreds of millions of animals each yeah. year. The scale is amazing. on a paradigm that isn't working, you yeah. know. And and to me, it's both of those things. It's so, the ethics of the harm and the lack of benefit that make it so important that we change. So hopefully, that dynamic where you've got the, the ethical driver and non-human animals, but you've also got this effectiveness drive just for better science and better. Mm -hmm. human solutions you would hope would open up the opportunity for coalitions of people from different perspectives to work together to really make things happen is, is, is how hopeful are you and what sort of things are you seeing as at different levels of governance whether it's you know law and some of the stuff i know you've been working on with the eu or whether it's mm -hmm. all the way down to individual institutions and policies and ethics review boards you how does it feel does it feel like things are shifting it does absolutely, and I think it's because of exactly what you said that there are there are a multitude a multitude of stakeholders here. Whether you're the patient advocacy groups who have been waiting and waiting for research that's going to benefit you know your patient population, whether it's the animal welfare and animal rights organizations who are are extremely concerned about the harms, and the scientific community who is under pressure but also you know these are scientists so so there are a lot of people who would like to see this paradigm change for you know multiple multiple reasons or for their own individual reasons and what that has done is create you know broader coalitions and what that has done is motivated lawmakers and policymakers um just recently in the in the United States we finally passed the FDA modernization act which is um now, uh, the case that the FDA, which here in the U.S. is the the main overseer of whether or not you know humans can take a certain compound or not, um, mm. had always required that data from animal tests be provided on on new compounds before they were uh, allowed to be tested in humans. But of course, those animal uh, tests were not predictive of the human response. So the yeah. FDA so there's literally no point with that requirement. Yeah. Exactly. So now the FDA can use data from these more human relevant and certainly more humane methods. And, and that was the result of a, of, of a group, different groups of people with different motivations. People need new drugs. They need them faster. They need them cheaper. Wasting a lot of money on, on ineffective animal tests makes it costlier to develop a new drug for the companies doing it and to the patient here in the U.S. You know, we have to pay for that, um, as you know, yeah. like a lot of money. <laughs> So oh, yeah. if we can if we can get to these new drugs and treatments faster, more effectively, um, that benefits everybody. So so what you are seeing is because of the the failure of the paradigm itself, because of the harm of the paradigm itself, because of the cost of the paradigm itself, and that's a time cost, you know, a temporal cost and a financial cost, is people are starting to find this common ground. Um, and uh, PETA. PETA entities worldwide, PETA in the U.S., but also worldwide, have developed a, a research modernization deal, which is basically a phase-out plan to uh, 
phase out animal experimentation in biomedical research and regulatory testing, and it's evidence based. Mm. So our motivation is is the the animals, but the truth is the science supports it one hundred percent. You yeah. know, we're we're spending billions of dollars around the world on ineffective animal tests, and that money could be much better used getting treatments and, and cures to patients either directly, you know, with intervention, prevention research, or by investing it into these better tools. And so we have, you know, a phase out plan that that looks at, you know, ending animal experiments where we know they don't work, making sure training tools are available for people who may have only been trained on animal-based tests and would like to transition, but there's no money available. Making sure we're evaluating these animal tests. Are they effective? Because nobody does that. Yeah. You'd think, oh, well, surely assumed. if they're going to, yeah, they just assume. <laughs> um, nobody's decide, you know, nobody's systematically evaluating how predictive a lot of animal experiments that we're currently conducting are. So, so this is, this is sort of a, a a multi-step plan that we hope could truly revolutionize the way we're doing biomedical research around the world. Um, and that benefits all of those stakeholders we talked about. It certainly benefits the animals because they won't be suffering in labs, but it's going to benefit taxpayers because your money's not going to be wasted. It's going to benefit patients because it'll get treatments and cures faster and 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 more cost effective. So so you know that's something that we're very proud of and that we work with various government institutions in our different in our different countries to get adopted in one form or another that's very hopeful it genuinely is a a win 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 and it is it's a win 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 and more power to you do you think there are lessons that other parts of the animal advocacy world could learn from what you're doing in animal exp experimentation so i'm thinking about particularly the you know the big beast of agricultural and food systems do you think there's lessons that people working on those problems could pick up from what you're doing in ex animal experimentation and testing i think we all learn from each other um mm. cuz it cuz again there there are a multitude of things we're trying to do one is to open up the conversation with with people about animals and the harms that they suffer wherever they're being exploited whether yeah. it's in a, a in a entertainment capacity or or like you said agriculture or experimentation and learning how that information how to how to phrase that information or present that in information that impacts people you yeah. know as i mentioned for me where it came to food um it was videos it was hearing the sounds of animals crying it was seeing the people in these factory farms beating and harming the animals. It was looking at the the conditions that the animals were living in, and even just looking at the the conditions of their bodies and knowing that this was not the way that anybody should live. Anybody should live. Um, so finding a way to co to communicate that information, but also challenging people's assumptions. Again, I always thought of a farm as you know, like a big space of green grass and a couple of chickens and a cow and somebody named Mary going out there with a bucket and collecting a couple of eggs and some milk. I had yeah. no idea. So I think, I, th I think, and again, I think, I think many people in the animal rights space have their own techniques and their own ideas about what's, what's most effective is um, challenging what are ingrained beliefs about these industries, whether it's agriculture industry or the entertainment industry or the experimental industry, and that includes complex discussion sometimes, but imagery is helpful. Um, at PETA, we do, if we obtain images from inside a laboratory, we will show them. Yep. People don't always like it, but yeah. we will show them because- It's the reality, right? It's the reality and people need to have that information. I think the biggest challenge for all of us, I think, is not just changing people's mindset, how they view animals, but that a lot of the ways that animals are exploited, including in animal experimentation, have uh, benefited people monetarily. So you're, you, you can get you can live a healthy, you know, nutrient dense life without using animals. You can we can get new treatments and cures without using animals. But there are a whole bunch of people whose livelihood has been dependent on this exploitation. Yeah. Right. And certainly in the biomedical research community, even not just the scientists who get the grants, I'm talking about the people who breed mice and import monkeys and design primate restraint restraint chairs, which in some cases cost more than a car. 
you know, there's a lot of people making a lot of money off of these industries. And I think it's important to make sure that the public knows that some of the messaging they get is from those folks. Yeah. You know, we so our motivation is questioned all the time, right? Like people are like, oh, you're an animal rights person. Of course, you're going to say this or that. We're not making money off of this, right? You yeah. always, yeah. you know, following the Big money. Plant. Yeah. <laughs> Big bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but 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 there are people who are, and I, and I think that being aware of that and knowing that that will inherently impact their motivation and the messaging they're willing to give you, and to be, you know, savvy to that, yeah, helps it. And again, I think that's across the world. But I tend and, and to again, look... but and both of those, and we come back to the epistemology question, right? Because it's about mm -hmm. the, the facts of the harm being done and being mm -hmm. clear about that also cutting through the disinformation and the misinformation of those entrenched interests who want to tell you it's a happy farm or tell you that you know this type of research is highly effective and it's the only thing we can do so it's right. cutting through that to try and get a clearer understanding of where things really are and i guess the other the other parallel i was thinking of is was more about the mechanisms of change and the levers of change particularly when we're mm -hmm. thinking about institutional change and mm -hmm. one of the th things i think might be a really interesting lesson that can come from the experimentation space across to animal agriculture. And uh, I think people are to some extent working on this already is this idea that, you know, getting the facts straight and winning the ethical argument just isn't enough. We need to find ways of, you know, presenting really attractive, easy opportunities for mm -hmm. everybody involved. So in the food yeah. space, of course, you know, you think of consumers, right? Mm -hmm. If you can have a nice impossible burger next to the Mm -hmm. flesh burger you know that helps but it, it's almost more interesting as you think about the institutional levels yes. and and you've already talked about some great examples there where you you're engaging with scientists or you know uh pharmacy the pharmacy industry and so on and in almost in their terms presenting yes. a better way right and i think that is that is key um and we, and we hear about this with anything not just agriculture but environmental causes right we want people to rely less on say coal but again, here in the U.S. and and I know in in at least in Wales, um, there are people who's in you know generations of people who that is their livelihood. Yeah, livelihood, and identity, history. Yes, it's their culture. How, how they fed their families. <laughs> exactly. It's it's so it, it's generationally ingrained, and um, in the same way that we need to offer up. Or we like to offer up alternatives to somebody who says, well, I, I care about animals, but I really just need a burger every once in a while. Then you say, well, then, you know, next time you go to the pub, get yourself this impossible burger. They have it. At, um, you need to do that for for at least for the scientific community, which is one of the, the reasons yeah. that we did develop, you know, PETA's research modernization deal, because we're not taking money away from the research um, community. We're just moving it slightly to the right, you know. And the research community is very good at following that that carrot, if you will. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, they they can direct their research towards a funding opportunity faster than anybody you know. You know, I can make my research fit this this niche where they're going to give money. Um, so so again, it, it's not about trying to put people out of jobs. It's it's simply reprioritizing where we're putting that funding in a way. That, as you said, can win, win, win. Right? We can we can reduce the harms, reduce the number of animals that are being harmed. Eventually, end the use of animals, but in a way that the scientific community can transition uh, comfortably. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. but they have to want to do it, right? Yeah. And we've just got to help everybody... help them want to do it. <laughs> help. The, so you have to help them want to do it, and then you have to help them actually do it. And I think that's where. It can be difficult, um, but it's it's worth it. So so obviously that's why we do the work we do. But I I think you're right. Like a a replacement for people who enjoy meat is one thing. A replacement for people whose life is embedded in producing meat is is also something to consider. Yeah. And to have the support for that, not just say go get a job over at that office, but say here's a, you know, here's some federal funding, here's some state funding that would, you know, help you develop the skills that you need, um, support you while you're, while you're making this transition, I think would be amazing. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the, all of those people involved in these industries and systems are sentient beings too, right? So yes. yeah, we, we sort of need a 
a -hmm. compassionate just transition all the way up I and down. I think that the, would be the most the effective yeah. thing. Yeah. Might be a better thing to spend the subsidies on than perpetuating these helpful it, industries. But... And when you think about how much <laughs> how much money we spend perpetuating it, just reinvesting that in helping people move away from that yeah. Yeah. would be so effective everywhere, right? Even if it's the people like, you know, who are, I'm not a big fan of horse racing, as you could tell. Help them find another job. I'm not, I'm not trying to put them on the unemployment line. I just want them to stop harming animals for their job. And I'm willing to do the work to help them make that transition if they're willing to make that transition. And meeting people in that middle space is probably going to be the best thing we could do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the only way. And it's been inspiring to hear how you're putting that into practice in the experimentation space. So, yeah, thank you very much for that. It's given me some We're certainly me some trying. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to add on this sort of how can we make a better future uh, story. I want to respect your time because I know you're coming up on the time. I said we'd finish up, uh, but that's been a great story to hear. So, oh, I think I, you know, I think everybody who's listening probably knows that. You know, it's just for me again. I like to take into consideration, and again, it's hard to do because we're busy. You know, you've got your habits, you've got your routines, you've got your responsibilities, whether they're at the job or, or at home. You forget. You know, you get into the habit of doing things and not thinking about them questioning everything that you do and, and whether it is harmful to anyone every day is, is useful um certainly and i'm sure other people from PETA have said please if you would love i would love to have you come to PETA.org slash rmd which is where we have all of the information about our research modernization deal i think people will 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 be pleasantly surprised i think people don't realize that PETA literally has more scientists on staff than any other animal rights organization with a diverse group of backgrounds. So, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, but we have people with expertise in basically every area of science working towards this shift and working towards a shift that will be win, win, win. You know, get the animals out of those labs, keep the scientists employed and get the patients the cures and treatments they desperately need faster and cheaper. Um, so if you're more interested in that, please go to, to RMD. But on a bigger picture, just be, you know, just just think about it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, you can go a long way with empathy and then thoughtfulness. I think that can mm -hmm. carry you a long yes. way, as you said earlier on. Yeah. So you pointed us at uh, Peter's resources already. How about you individually? Do you do your social media or any any of your own oh, stuff that yes. you point people towards? Or Sure, I would love it. Um, so, so the division that I work in at PETA is in the US is the Science Advancement and Outreach division and we have a twitter account where we are constantly updating people on research using these human relevant methods um having discussions about animal welfare and how the poor animal welfare in, in laboratories actually impacts the science um because yeah. animals who are stressed out and lonely give bad data um and so it's at sao science um, so if you're science minded and you like hearing all the new the new non-animal research that's out there or um, like to engage in discussions about animals in laboratories. Uh, we would love to have you. We love having these conversations. Yeah, I think that's that's it for me on social media. But please, please, please go to go to peta.org slash rmd to see the plan because I think people will I think people will be pleasantly surprised and and on board when they realize that it benefits everybody. Yeah. Everybody. You're making real progress already. Yes. around the world so yeah well thank you so much it's been a real pleasure to speak to you on sentientist conversations i think i'm going to claim you as a sentientist oh, at the moment. you know what i'll take it because <laughs> i i don't have i have no philosophical label for myself so if you want to give one to me based on this discussion that will go make for me it feel i mean who okay. could disagree with evidence reason and compassion for all sentient beings exactly. i mean it's pretty straightforward I'll, really i think i'd like sentient i can't even say it sentientist yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? I think if you say sentient and then just add ism on the end, it's okay. But other, it does have too many syllables. Sentientism. Sentientism. That's but it's it, yeah. sentientist as a as a sentientist. grounding you, philosophy. Yeah, some people just say it's you know a worldview they agree with. Other people like to identify as a sentientist, but you know up to up to people how you know how seriously they want to take it. But hopefully, it's a pluralistic philosophical baseline that eventually all eight billion humans will come to agree with. Right. We'll make the world we'll a better there. place. Yeah, I have yeah. faith that we'll get there. We need to get there. We yeah, need I to. think if enough people watch our conversation today, I'm sure that'll be this way. <laughs> that'll be it. We'll have yeah. everybody convinced. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I will let you get on with the rest of your day. Please do stay in touch. Thank um, you very and, and much. And it's been for an honor to me. talk to you. It has been great to talk to you. Thank you. Hard questions, but important ones. Thank you.
Cheers, Catherine. Cheers.